Selling All Cars, a presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. A police radio patrol car cruises slowly about the city. It is a quiet evening, and the two police officers have made only routine calls. Who we'll guess the announcer at headquarters has forgotten us, Bill. We haven't had a call in two hours. Yeah, sure. We cleaned up the district and scared all the bad boys away. Don't worry. Rosie will find something for us to do. Even if it's only a 390 causing a 415. But I wish this radio would give us something besides police calls. I like to listen to a good program. I get tired of listening to Rosie every night. Hey, calling all cars is on tonight. I like to listen to it. They're doing one of the boss's cases. No, nope, my lad, we're on duty. And the closest you'll get to the Calling All Cars program is that tank full of Rio Grande cracked gasoline in back of it. <laughs> I guess that's right. Rio Grande can't say that we listen to their program and then don't use cracked gasoline. You know, I hear that Rio Grande has a lot of contracts with California and Arizona cities. They tell me that Rio Grande cracked gasoline is used in more police cars and emergency equipment than any other brand. All I know is that we use only Rio Grande cracked gasoline for all police cars. And a darn good thing, too. There's no question about it, Ed. Those Rio Grande boys put out the liveliest gasoline in these parts. I'll back this old cruiser up against the racing car when she's full of Rio Grande crack. Hold it. Here comes the call. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 54. Description of robbery suspects. Number one in America in 40 years. Brown hair, brown eyes. Has a Roman nose. Wearing a gray cap. Number two, about 32 years. Fair complexion, blue eyes. These men blew the safe in a laundry in Venice last night. Watch for them, boys. That's all. Rolls and quits. It is now our privilege to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department, through whose cooperation these programs are brought to you. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. A vital link in the chain of facts which lead from the crime to the conviction of the criminal is the description and identification of suspects by the citizen who was present when the crime was committed. This link is one of the weakest. The average citizen is not trained to observe carefully, and under the emotional strain of an unusual circumstance, such as a holdup or a murder, he will be even less likely to be correct in his description. In tonight's story, you will learn how important the keen eyes of two citizens were to the police in placing the guilt of the crime squarely on the shoulders of those to whom it belonged. I hope everyone within sound of my voice will realize this fact and consider himself as a sort of an auxiliary officer, holding himself ready at all times to be of assistance to his police department. Only by the united cooperation of the whole citizen body may crime be completely eradicated. watchman of a large laundry in Venice is bent over a machine, making a minor repair when he hears a sound. Stop. Uh, who's there? Take off, old man. What? Risk him, bud. Uh, no gas. Uh, what, what, what do you want? Uh, we didn't come here for our laundry. Where's the safe? In there, in the office. Is there anyone else in the building besides you? Yes, sir. there's Lowry. Who's he? He's the handyman around the place. Uh, well, where is he now? He's asleep in the room next to the office. All right, take us to him. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, this way. Uh, he's he's in there. Hey, you. Hmm. Wake up. Wake up. Huh? <coughs> oh, what's all the for? Is that you, Ferguson? Yes, I'm here, but I got someone with me. They're, they're robbers. Oh, oh, robbers? Well, what do you want? I want you to get up and get some clothes on. Uh, all right. All right. Keep your britches on and they find mine. That flashlight don't do so good. Don't you tell them the light? Okay, where is it? Uh, right here. Huh. That's better. Huh. Now you can't expect a man to go playing around in front of a gun without his pants on. There. 
Oh, what do you want with me? They want you to stay right here. We can watch you. Ain't yeah, nobody going to do. They're going to blow your safe. Uh, uh, well, give me a chance, though, men. For instance, I don't want to get blue. Ah, oh, you'll have the same chance we have. Yeah, we don't even share in the hole. All right, cut the comedy. Keep your eye on them, bud, while I get up this safe. Okay, I won't let them go away. Fifteen minutes, while the one bandit drills a hole in the safe and packs it with nitroglycerin, the other chats with his two prisoners in the next room. Finally. Okay, here's the gold. Hang on to your seats, boys. Let her ride. You bust open? That's it. Is that all the noise it makes? Well, I thought it nearly blew up the building. No, safes don't need much soap when you know how to handle them. Well, here's the stuff. Now, if I can get this cash box open, we're all set. Now, why go to all that bother here? Why not take the box along? You're perfectly welcome to it. Well, that's a good idea. And do you think you'll get enough pay for your trouble? Oh, I don't think we'll do so bad with this. Well, I hope so. It'd be ashamed of going to all that bother for just a few bucks. Say, what are you doing, trying to kid me? No, 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 of course not. Well, I don't like your attitude. Now, get this. If you guys know what's good for you, you'll stay right here for 15 minutes. By that time, we'll be in Santa Monica. You sure you don't mean Culver City? No, I don't mean Culver City. Come on, bud. Let's get out of here. And remember, you two, stay where you are for 15 minutes. So long. We ought to call the police. Uh, uh, not me. <laughs> I've lived a pretty long life by staying out of trouble. And I've been looking at the business end of that revolver long enough for one night. I'm going to do just as they say. I'm sitting tight for 15 minutes. <laughs> At the end of 15 minutes, the watchman call the Venice station of the Los Angeles Police Department and report the robbery. Detective Captain Hawtrey answers the call and questions the two witnesses. Well, now, can you give me a description of these men? Well, I, I didn't get such a good look at the one that did the safe blowing, but I did notice that he had sort of an eagle beat nose. The one that stood guard over us was a young fellow, about 30, with brown hair, light complexion, and blue eyes. He had big front teeth, and his jaw was undershot. He had on pin striped dark pants, a gray cap, and a blue shirt. Well, that's a mighty clear description. Well, I couldn't help taking it all in. He sat under the bright light there, and I just kept looking at him, figuring that you would want a, a good description of him. Well, I wish all citizens would give us as good a description as that. Yeah, well, lots of citizens don't realize that they're really part of the police force, too. Well, they are, you know. Yeah, that's right. A sort of an auxiliary force. But they don't often accept their responsibility as willingly as you do. Now, let me see. This is the blanket they used to muffle the sound of the explosion? That's right. Yeah, I can see where it's been burned. Yeah, here's some of the soap they used to hold that soup in. <laughs> take this along with me. Uh, here's a rope that they tied the soap with. Thanks. I'll need that for evidence, too. Now, Mr. Lowry, how much money did they get away with? Well, I ain't sure, but I imagine it would be a couple of hundred dollars. I see. Well, I won't keep you up any longer. Uh, get this description out on the teletype now, and if any new development occurs, let me know, will you? Yeah, you bet I will, Captain. Good night. Good night, Mr. Lowry. <laughs> Having broadcast the description of the bandit, Captain Hawtrey gets a few hours sleep. But early the next morning, he is summoned to the laundry by Mr. Lowry, who promises him some very important information. The two men meet on Washington Boulevard, just outside the laundry. Good morning, Mr. Lowry. What's on your mind? Well, in the first place, uh, this Japanese fellow lives on Narcissus Avenue behind the laundry, came over to this morning when... He heard about the robbery and told me that last night when he was coming home, he saw a fool parked near the house with two men in it. And when his headlights picked him up, they ducked and drove off. I see. Well, what else? Yeah, come along with me down the street to this lunch counter. Well, who's there? Well, I was in there for breakfast this morning, and I told Mrs. Baker, the proprietor, about the robbery. 
And she told me about something suspicious that occurred there last night. Yeah? Well, what was it? Uh, we'll let her tell you. Tell you off. Come on. Well, well. Here I am back again, Mrs. Baker. I brought Captain Horfrey with me. He's a detective on our case. Oh, well, please to meet you, Captain. He very often we get prominent people like you in this little place. Mr. Lowry tells me that you saw something suspicious last night. Well, yes, I did, Captain. I was in here last night making myself some sandwiches before I went to bed. You know, I like a little snack before I turn in. Makes me sleep better. Oh, yes, well, uh, uh, you see, I'd closed up so I didn't turn on the lights. I could see what I was doing from the street light shining in. And, well, while I'm spreading away, a sort of delivery truck pulls up in front of the place. And I think to myself, now that's funny that a delivery truck would stop in front of a closed place of business at this time of night. And while I was thinking that, a Ford touring car drove up behind the truck and stopped. Now, the man in the delivery truck took a package out from under the seat cushion and carried it over and put it in the Ford. Then he came back and took out two or three smaller packages and stuffed them in his pocket, and then both men got into the Ford and drove away, leaving the delivery wagon out front. Did you get the license number of either car? Well, no, but there was a sign on the side of the truck. What did it say? It said, uh... Straight Run Delivery Service. Now, wait a minute till I get that down. Straight Run Delivery Service. <laughs> of course, I don't suppose all this has anything to do with that robbery up the laundry. It's silly of me to mention it, I guess. No, I don't think so, Mrs. Baker. I think you've done us a great favor. And I want to thank you for your help. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Uh, the Chief. And if you boys are around this way, don't you forget that I make awful good apple pie. <laughs> Captain Hawtrey immediately contacts Detective Lieutenant J.E. Herman of the police market detail. And together they call upon the manager of the straight run delivery service. I'm sorry, but Mr. Watson isn't in right now. Would you care to wait? Yes, we'll wait. Hey, let's take a look out there on the runway, just for fun. All right. We'll be outside, Miss Grant. Yes, sir. Well, there's no sense in wasting time. Let's look them over as they come in and go out. Okay. <laughs> Here's a hot one, Hawtrey. We'd better not try to chase any of these trucks. Why not? Look at this gasoline pump. They use Rio Grande crack gasoline. The same gasoline our police cars use. Well, I'm darned if it isn't. You know, these fellows are getting smart, too. Hey, say, look. What? Look at that fellow over there getting into that truck. Say, he's a dead ringer for Larry's description. Oh, I know him. He's an ex-con. I had him in about 18 months ago. Name's Cecil Adams. Yeah, and he's driving truck number 26, license number AP373. He's done plenty of time. We put him away in 1921 for robbery. He didn't get out of the big house until 1926. You mean you got his mug at headquarters? Sure, I got three or four mugs of him. Hey, that's swell. Come on, let's beat it down to the bureau. I want to get an identification from Mr. Lowry if I can. <laughs> Hawtrey obtains three pictures of Adams and shuffles them with several pictures of various other criminals. Of various other criminals. Then he calls on Mr. Lowry at the laundry. Well, Mr. Lowry, we'd like to have some more help. Well, anything I can do, sir, I'd be glad to do. Yes, I know you will. Now, Mr. Lowry, I have here several months of criminals. Will you look through them and see if you can recognize the man who held you prisoner last night? Sure, be glad to. Hmm. Well, uh, this looks a little like him. No, let's see. Uh, let's see. No, uh, 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 none of these is him. Hey, hey, well, wait a minute. Here's another picture of him. Hey, you've got three pictures of the same guy here, Captain. And that's the guy is the man you're looking for. Thanks, Mr. Lowry. That's what I figured. But I wanted an identification from you. Mr. Ferguson, the night watchman, confirms Lowry's identification. Assured that he's on the right trail, Hawtrey returns to Los Angeles, joins Herman, and together they return to the straight run delivery service office. Truck 26 is parked by the curb. So to prevent any suspicion, the police officer is parked some distance away. 
When they see Adams get in truck number 26, they tail him, and several blocks further down Los Angeles Street, they force him into the curb. Hey, what is this, a stick-up? They're police officers. Well, what do you want? We're under arrest. Get down off that truck. Hey, wait a minute. What's it all about? I think you've got a pretty good idea. Keep your eye on him, Jack. I want to take a look under this seat. Uh-huh. Just as I expected, two guns wrapped in a newspaper dated the 13th. That's the date of the robbery, isn't it? That's right. Hey, and here are two packages containing bullets. Where did you get these guns, Adam? I never saw them before. This is the truck you usually drive, isn't it? Sure, I own it. I drive it for the delivery service on a percentage basis. Are you the only man who drives this truck? Well, I'm supposed to be. Where do you live? A uh, room with a fellow named Harrison on the Vaughn Street. Harrison's the guy I arrested with Adams 18 months ago. He works for the delivery service, too. Okay. Let's go over and have a talk with him. You're Harrison, aren't you? Yeah, why? Well, we're police officers. We've just arrested Cecil Adams for robbery, burglary, and safe blowing. And he told us that he lived with you. And we believe that you were his partner on that job the other night. What about it? Well, that bum hasn't been inside my house for two weeks. He's got no right telling you he was living with me. But he did live with you. Yeah, but he and my wife had a fight a couple of weeks ago. She threw him out. Where were you on the night of April 13th? 13th? Well, Saturday. Well, on Saturday night, I was making deliveries in Alhambra. I can prove that by my receipt. Besides, I took my wife and baby along with me. We got home a little after nine and went to bed. And I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll all ride out to your house and check that story with your wife. Without giving Harrison the opportunity to coach his wife, Autry asks her about her husband's whereabouts on April 13th. Her story is in complete agreement with that of her husband, and Harrison is eliminated as a possible suspect. He expresses himself willing to aid police in discovering Adams' present residence and leads them to the house of Adams' brother on West 52nd Street. As the police car pulls up, a man enters a house across the street. I believe that's one of the Adams brothers going in that house now. And that looks like their Ford parked across the street. Well, I'm going to see what they've got to say. Jack, you better get around to the back so no one runs out. Okay, Captain. Your name, Adams? My name is Otis Adams. What can I do for you? I'm a police officer. We're making an investigation regarding your brother Cecil. Well? Is that your Ford across the street? It is. Does your brother Cecil have the use of that car? He does. Did he have it last Saturday night? I don't know. I can't remember. He uses it whenever he wants to. Now, listen here, Adams. That's only a couple of nights ago. You'll remember that far back. Did your brother have that car Saturday night? Now, look here. If you think I'm going to make any statements incriminating my brother, you're all wet. We'd have to search this place, Adams. Go ahead. You won't find anything. Hawtrey and his partner do find something. In the garage, keys to which have been obtained from Otis Adams, they discover an electric drill wrapped in part of a newspaper dated April 13th and a coil of rope similar to that discovered at the laundry. They face Adams with their finds. Where did you get this drill, Adams? I never saw it before in my life. Yeah, and how about this rope? I never saw it either. Huh? Where does your brother Cecil live? Somewhere out near Huntington Drive. I don't remember the address. Oh, that's a lie, and you know it. He hasn't lived there for two weeks. Well, if he doesn't live there, I don't know where he lives. Isn't it the fact that he lives across the street at uh, 1019? If it is, I don't know it. And isn't it the fact that you live there, too, and only take your meals here with your other brother and his wife? All right. You don't need to answer that. Your brother Charles just told me so up in the kitchen. Come on. Let me take a look at that fort of yours. interesting. Here's the other half of that paper dated April 13th. How do you explain that? Well, there were a couple of hundred thousand papers like that printed on April 13th. And how about this registration slip? You know, this isn't made out to you. Well, I just got the car a week ago. I haven't had time to change it. Well, that's a violation of the law in itself. Well, if it is, it's the only thing you can get on me. Well, we'll see about that. Now, tell me, 
You do live at 1019, don't you? You're conducting this party, not me. Well, come on. We'll find out quick enough. Well, I guess we'd better try some of these keys from your key ring. Well, this one looks as if it might work. Well, good guess. Yes, Senor Adams, pardon me. I was just coming to the door. It's all right, ma'am. Does this man live here? Si, yes, senor. The two brothers, they room here with me. Good. Which is his room? A little way down the hall here. Come along, Adam. In here, senor. Thank you. Well, now I'll just take a look through these drawers over here. Well, you don't take much precaution in hiding this stuff, Adams. Nickels and dimes and quarters. That was the denomination of that money stolen from the laundry the other night. Yeah? Yeah. Say, whose nice black bag is this? Oh, it's locked. You know, I hate to ruin it by breaking it open. Do it yourself. Well, now, maybe it won't be necessary. This keyring of yours is probably going to come in handy. Now, let me see. Yeah, this key looks about right. Well, well. Five sticks of dynamite and a whole safe-cracking outfit. You know, Adams, our police chemist will undoubtedly find that this little piece of yellow soap is the same as that soap you left from the blanket in the laundry. And he'd probably make certain that the bits of white plaster on this drill is from the fireproofing of that safe. You know, physical evidence is such an exact science these days. I don't know what you're talking about. Where did you get all this stuff, Adams? I never saw it before in my life. No, Adams, don't you think that's a little bit thick? I find this bag in your room, and I open it with a key from your key ring. Say, you don't expect me to believe that you never saw this stuff before. I don't know anything about it. Well, you're sure going to learn something about it, because I'm placing you under arrest right now on suspicion of robbery. Otis and Cecil Adams refuse to admit or deny their guilt. Refuse to answer any question. California law rules that refusal to deny guilt constitutes an admission thereof. Therefore, the two brothers are formally charged with robbery, burglary, grand theft, and burglary with explosives. The next day, Hawtrey interviews the two. Now, boys, we don't care whether you confess or not. We've got an unbeatable case against you. We found those guns in your possession as well as the jimmy and the brace you used on that job. And the electric drill that you stole from that machine shop at the laundry that night will be identified by its serial number. These circumstances and the identification by those two watchmen will be enough to convict you. But what's bothering me is the $250 worth of checks you stole. Now, those are a dead loss to that laundry. And unless you burned them, I... I thought I wish you'd tell me where they are. How about it, Cecil? Well, I'm very sorry I can't help you, Captain. But I can for the simple reason that I don't know what you're talking about. You know, there was also a woman's ring set with five pearls in that box you took. Now, the girl who owns that works in that laundry, and she placed it in that box for safekeeping. And, boy, she's heartbroken over the loss of it. Come on, now, be regular, fellas, and give it back to her. Well, Captain, you've been square with us. I'd certainly like to help you, but I don't know anything about a check or ring. This is all Greek to me. Yeah? Have you ever been arrested before, Otis? Never in my life. And you're lying, Otis, because I believe that you're an ex-convict. And I'm going to send your fingerprints to the Bureau of Identification at Washington and get your past record. Well, send them any place you like, but you'll never get anything on me. Washington replies to Hawtrey's request for information that in 1909, Otis Adams, under the name of James Kennedy, had been sentenced to serve 10 years in the state penitentiary in Waltham, Wisconsin, for burglary and safe blowing. In 1917, he went to Leavenworth for blowing a post office safe in Illinois. On the day of the preliminary trial, Hawtrey received Adams, alias Kennedy's Bertillion card and photographs. While the trial is getting underway, Hawtrey seats himself beside Adams in the courtroom and shows him the pictures. Hey, Otis, have you ever seen this bird before? Gee, he looks like a Slovak, doesn't he? <laughs> Are you a Slovak? No, of course not. 
Well, you see, this picture is a dead ringer for you. In fact, I'd say it was you. Well, lots of people in the world look alike. Yeah, but you know, isn't it rather a coincidence that you should have all the same scars and markings and tattoo marks as this man? Oh, I don't know. Those things will happen. Yeah. And wait and see what happens when the witness just taken the chair testifies. Tell me swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God. I do. What's your name? Hey, Steve Laurie. And what is your occupation? I'm a handyman down at the Bay City's laundry. On the night of April 13th, did anything unusual occur at the laundry? Yes. There was a lot of dirty work down there. <laughs> order, order, Mr. Court. Will you explain to the court, please, just what you mean by dirty work? It was robbed by two men. Hmm. Did you see these men? I did. Are they present in this courtroom? Yes, sir. Please point them out to the court. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to. Why not? Because I'm afraid. Afraid of what? There's nothing to be afraid of in court. No, but I don't know how long these fellows will be in court. And I don't know how many friends they've got on the outside. I looked into the business end of guns and off that night. I don't want no more of it. <laughs> Mr. Lowry, if the two men are in the room and you are able to identify them, it is a court order that you do so. Very well, Your Honor. If you say I must, then I guess I must. Uh, wait, wait till I get me cane. Well, that's all right, Mr. Lowry. You can point them out from where you're sitting. Uh, uh, just a minute, young man. Now, I'll do this as I see fit. I don't want to make no mistakes. I want to look at these men closely. All right, young men. I'm ready now. Good. Now will you point them out, please? Yeah. Well, that man sitting next to Captain Hawtrey is the man who drilled the safe that night. And the man sitting at the end of the table is the one who set guard over us. Thank you, Mr. Lowry. Your witness. Thank you. Now, Mr. Lowry, will you please describe the clothes worn by the two men on the night of the robbery? Well, I can't be sure of them, but... Only that they were of some dark material. Of some dark material, huh? Mr. Lowry, how can you be so positive in your identification? Well, this fellow sat down right under a bright electric light, and he talked to us for 15 minutes with, while the other fellow blew the safe. I had plenty of time to look at him. And if that's the case, can you describe the clothes he wore on the night of April 13th? No, only they were of some dark material. Is he wearing the same clothes now as he wore that night? I don't know if he's wearing the same clothes. But one thing I'm sure of... What's that? He's wearing the same face. As the officers piled up their formidable mass of evidence against the Tasserton brothers, they received a distinct surprise when, on June 17th, they went into court, pled guilty and admitted their prior convictions. Each was sentenced to Folsom Penitentiary for from seven years to life, and in view of the prior convictions against them, they must spend at least 18 years behind prison bars. Thank you, Chief Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, more and more independent service stations are now featuring Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Sales of Rio Grande are growing faster than any other gasoline sold in this territory. Most Rio Grande users, we know, are listeners to Calling All Cars. You have heard us tell you on these programs why Rio Grande cracked gasoline is specified by so many cities for their police cars, fire engines, and other emergency equipment. We have promised you police car performance in your own car if you would try Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Thousands of you accept this invitation right after every broadcast of Calling All Cars. And our records show that you come back to Rio Grande stations again and again because you find that you really do get greater speed, greater power, and more economical mileage. To you regular Rio Grande users, thanks for your loyalty. And to you listeners who have not yet felt the thrill of police car performance in your own cars, well, there's a Rio Grande dealer in your neighborhood.
Los Angeles police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 54 regarding robbery suspects. These suspects are now in custody. That's all. Rolls and quotes. Calling all cars based on conversation.